Welcome back to The Charismatic Voice, where I have a short list of bands that I want to listen to for the first time that is really not that short. On that list is Skid Row, and I've been wanting to listen to them for three years now. Frankly, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I haven't heard Sebastian Bach yet. Maybe I was just waiting for the right moment, but the moment does not need to be perfect to listen to awesome music. Music can strike us anywhere at any time. So now is the moment. Let's get to it. is so much softer than I thought I was getting myself into. For some reason, I've had this idea of Skid Row being just edgy, uh, being, yeah, I, I, I hear Skid Row and I think about Los Angeles and Skid Row, which is just a bleak place sometimes. There's some corners of it that have really, really cool things going on, but mostly you go there and you're confronted by this horrible situation of so many people that are homeless and why can't we help them more? So Skid Row has all kinds of undertones in that meaning. And I thought that this was gonna be like really, really edgy and angry. <laughs> it's like very soft and lovely. Yes, it did get into a little heavier rock at one point, but acoustic guitar for beginners was just like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Where did I go wrong here? Okay, back to the beginning. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Ooh, lovely. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Sebastian Bach's vocals. There is beautiful through line with his breath. It sounds like everything I'm hearing is being carried by the breath, which is what should be happening with any vocal. His though, it, it's almost like you can hear this start of the ocean surf from far away, which is like the breath gearing up. And then you just hear it all pass by and it's like, has little bubbles underneath it and you hear how that carries an entire melody. It's just, it's beautiful. Some of the most audible carrying of breath and music that I've heard in a singer. I'm gonna go back one more time and point out some of the areas that I'm specifically hearing that in. It's just, it's so lovely. <laughs> So I still hear after the end of rain, rain. It's like, it's almost like there's a cresting of the wave of breath over that constant. There's, uh, even when he starts, it sounds like he's jumping onto the surf. And you can definitely hear after you, there's, it's like he's getting rid of the last bit of breath was in the system. You don't want to have stagnant air in your system, okay? Like lots of singers do the opposite thing where they get too much air that then becomes stagnant and they can't really use it very well for singing. So it sounds like he's getting rid of stagnant air or sort of leftover air at the end of that phrase. And then you hear him take a breath in and go straight back into the song. It's important for breath in singing, that you don't take a breath and then hold it before coming back in on a note. You need to take that breath, and the moment you take that breath, 
you are already committed to singing. You need to plan that breath at the right time. Take that breath and then jump in on that wave and just go. You can hear, it sounds like he doesn't even have a break in this process whatsoever because he's letting the stagnant air go and immediately bringing a breath in right afterwards to jump into the next phrase. It's all cyclical and it started the moment that the song started. To get up for extension. That sounds like that sounds like a chorus to me that we just got into. I want to point out a couple more things. I'll go back and then let us get into this chorus. One of them is that this is very rangy. You guys probably knew this already because you've been recommending Sebastian Bach for a long time. But it it is impressive to me how it's super rangy. And when it goes up into the top, the voice actually gets even more concentrated. It gets like a little extra heft because he's not flipping over. Um, not going into an upper register. He's really narrowing and focusing his sound really, really well. I like the way he's, it feels like he's sort of threading a needle with his sound up there to keep it super gathered. A lot more air is flowing in this part and a lot more energy in the top. Right there. It's like a needle thread in the concentration of the voice. That's such a cool little break. Okay, there were a couple, oh gosh, there were several things in here. I'm gonna have to go back and, and try and like whack-a-mole them as they're coming up. <laughs> One of the big things happened here just at the very end. I'll just come back and point it out right away because there's this rundown. And a lot of times when people are doing a descending extended run like this, they let the sound sort of drop back and lose energy. It's already going down in pitch. It's already gonna be losing energy. If you keep that feeling of it coming forward, continually presenting the sound out this way, it can help prevent it from feeling like it chunks back and you lose your audience's attention when that happens. I'll go back one more time, see if I can catch that moment, and then I'll go way back and whack-a-mole. It's actually a very long phrase to do that into. Okay, way back now. So on remember, I, there's this little sort of call off that I've heard a bunch of times, but I hear it right there, especially remember. He's accenting this with a, a play in the pitch, essentially. And things like this are things that sometimes we lose in contemporary music production because he is playing with the pitch there to emphasize it. If you were to use some sort of pitch correction software, you would lose that emphasis. If people use pitch correction today, I think really successfully, they have to do it so lightly, you definitely can't tell it's there. And, and be careful to not sacrifice expression for this weird idea that something is is perfect in pitch it is so much more important to bring heart 
than it is to bring perfection. Uh, so back one more time, check that out again. So it happens right on burr. There's a little, like a tiny slide down off of it. Other thing in here that's really fun is, even though it's going up and down a lot, it's all one phrase. He does a lot with just one breath. Here we go, there's that phrase. There was no breath there, it was a little glide between. So that went up and down three times, essentially. There was a tiny break that had no breath. It was what sometimes we'll call that scanning, where maybe you have a slight lift, but you're not actually taking a breath. Your first breath was the one that went all the way through. So after Remember Yesterday, right after that is where this entire phrase starts. That was the scan. Let it keep going for now. So many fascinating interjections there from, I think electric guitar was the one that was like doing a little talkative thing back and forth at one point. That was cool. Uh, overall, his tone quality actually has a lot of nasality in it. Gives it cut and can give it some clarity too. But a lot of people will veer away from nasality and say, oh, no, 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 that's bad. I don't want to sound nasal as if it's something that's just... I think this is a very subjective thing, honestly. I think people can have an extremely nasal voice and be extremely successful in music. I don't know why there's a sort of idea that nasality is bad in general when there are so many successful artists that have it in their sound. It actually sounds like a similar balance of soft palate drop. <laughs> when, you, when your soft palate is down, your sound can exit more through your nose. And if it's just partially down, we get this combination, right, of, of exiting through the nose or exiting through the mouth. And that percentage will be part of what determines nasality in the sound. So Klaus from The Scorpions has, I think, a similar mix in his sound of nasality, where it actually goes quite nasal at times, yet many people consider it very, very beautiful uh, and definitely has a, a wonderful clarity too. So just food for thought. Like what, what, how much nasality is good in a sound? What do you think? I'd love to hear your comments if you're there with me in the live premiere in the chat. That's so much fun. I love chatting with you guys there. Or just write them on the video below and look at other people's comments. Thumbs up, comment, have this big discussion. How much nasality do you like in music? And be respectful because some people will have other preferences and that is totally fine. It is actually really, really wonderful, I think, to have that kind of diversity back and play once more. There's some at the end. Wow, that's actually very nasal right there.
Gosh, that was that was such an adventure in, in vowel formation right there. And you, his uvel up high has consistently been more closed than I expected him to be able to maintain it while maintaining a really nice sound, nice tone up there. And he's able to have a very closed ooh vowel on top without dropping as much. That uh, That is not the common trend. Most people need to drop that jaw more for the top. Uh, additionally, I just, I keep thinking, okay, for me, when does it become too nasal? Because this is definitely not too nasal. I think he's actually using it very effectively and as a way to gain some more cut, as a way to keep the sound really forward so it doesn't ever feel like too chunky to get up over the top. Uh, I think that nasality bothers me when somebody doesn't have uh, a sort of like graduation, a gradual approach between tones. If suddenly their soft palate is dropping or suddenly it's going up, so I get like a jarring sense between nasality and lack of nasality, that that bothers me. Uh, I think that there needs to be the sense of the same person singing the whole time. And that there can be changes, right? It just not sudden massive changes. I don't want to feel like I'm in one room and then in another room, essentially. Uh, but gosh, beyond that, is, is, is there ever a time when there's too much nasality? I don't know if I could find an example of that. You guys could recommend some to me below though. That'll be fun. Let's go back and then keep going. Right? <laughs> That's that exciting vowel uh, journey. You uh, is the vowel. It's definitely not staying on. Ooh. It's going through at least three other vowels on the way there to the end. <laughs> Okay, I was gonna say that handoff to the guitar was really good and I feel guilty for pausing it. But there were like two things we gotta go back and check out. So one of them is this crazy, awesome, super clear depth thong for the wind, right? The idea that you know, there's like two vowels that put into one, but actually instead he made them like more than that. It's fun, we'll catch it. And then a uh, very impressive breath support there. He's got incredible efficiency at the true vocal fold level. Not only can he take a good breath and use it, but if you don't have efficiency here, there's no way you can make it through some of these long phrases that he's doing. That means that the connection of when those vocal folds come together and go wacka, 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 that it is very clean, full connection, uh, yet not too heavy, not too light at the same time. It's just really, really good efficiency. See if I can catch that dip bottle. That's my favorite vowel journey still. <laughs> Made. <laughs> that is that is your wonderful diphthong. Let's do that one more time. <laughs> Brilliant diphthong. So this solo, to me, does not feel like Bach. Just 
interesting. I when you guys first started recommending Sebastian Bach, I was like, wait, is is he related? I don't think so. Maybe somewhere far in his past, maybe possibly. But this this solo sounds like Mozart. I think it sounds like Mozart to me. Uh, there's a descending pattern in there that feels like something I've done in, in some Mozart pieces before on the piano. And the big leaps make me think of Mozart too. He was very fond of, of that, especially when he put it in there to screw up singers. Um, but it was really fun how you have some of those slides and the extra distortion and definitely the tone quality. I feel like if Mozart was living today, I think he might have a ton of fun writing for electric guitar. I don't know what it would sound like, but it might sound like this. Oh, hand back. Nice. So now as I'm seeing some of the visuals, we definitely have lots of moment with uh, lots of moments with homelessness as well. But then there's lots of things that feel very romantic, right? We've got a very ballad kind of piece going on. And I'm honestly a little confused about what the storyline is here. I'm trying to piece it together. It sounds like it might be a homeless person that is longing for a loved one. And so maybe that's our, our wrap in. Um, but I like the way that I was expecting something that felt so much more edgy, gritty overall, and with the idea of Skid Row in it. And this feels like it's soft and warm, big, big emotions for sure. Um, and it's just painting a, a different picture. It's uh, it's really beautiful. Wow. I love that as he's singing this here in the music video, you actually hear a lot of that same uh, same use of the enunciators in the recording. You can hear him singing through his teeth. You can see as he's uh, singing it in the music video, you can see that extra enunciation with the lips surrounding the teeth. That's cool. Way. I love that. That is really, really nice. Such a fantastic little dollop there of extra furious expression. Nothing else could ever take you away. Wow. I have to add the token hair hair comment. Wow, there's some amazing hair going on in the band. It's like we have like some Pantene Pro 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 V. What was that brand called again? Anyhow, it's got some serious uh, hair conditioner commercials that could be going on here. So ironic that we're saying, I remember you, I remember you, I remember you, but I'm dropping and walking all over your photographs. I guess sometimes the memories need to, to settle and rest. Oh, that made me sad. Okay. 
Interesting. He's definitely adding a little bit of fry into that sound. Huh. I like that as, as just a very early use of that expression. Like the idea that it's getting just totally beyond what clean singing can express anymore with the angst. Once again, with the ridiculously long phrases and great breath control. Oh my God. Back one more time. Wow. Ooh, there is an extra harmony in there. I missed the first time. Okay. has so much fun with the expression on the way down. It's it's like you get a little glimmer of Robert Plant in there and the way he's playing with these notes. It's not just picking out pitches, but it's picking out all of the fun mouth shapes to go with it and really taste each moment. Back to soft. I love how this song is combining this narrow, targeted, powerful sound from Sebastian Bach with a much broader, yet still very powerful, strong underlying instrumental. And then of course you have the balance of this soft beginning, soft end. There's even a little soft reprieve moment in there. It feels massive yet warm, all while having a voice that has this cut and nasality in it. So many different pleasing balances within the entirety. If you have any other recommendations for Sebastian Bach and Skid Row, please write them in the comments below or you can rattle them off in the YouTube premiere, but we count the comments below. We look for your suggestions there. Let me know what else you would like to hear and I'm gonna link you to some other songs that y'all have suggested in this playlist here. May you fall more in love with music every day.